Welcome to the Table Podcast, where we discuss issues of God and culture. Brought to you by Dallas Theological Seminary. Welcome to the table. We discuss issues of God and culture, and my guest today is Tom Nelson, who pastors in Kansas City, and the name of the church is Christ Community Church. Christ Community yeah. Church. That's a that's a good it's a name really for good a church. Name. Yeah, yeah. And then, uh, and he also is responsible for uh, an organization, a new organization called Made to Flourish. Right. That's right. And uh, and so this is a this is a ministry to pastors uh, and encouraging them with regard to faith and work matters. Correct. That's correct. Yeah, we're trying to help pastors connect Sunday to Monday. Well, okay. Well, that that's good. I, we call I call nine to five the great black hole in it, the church. It is. Yeah. yeah so, we need to do something about that. That's exactly right. So we're here to talk about uh, really the relationship between business people and pastoral staffs in the church. So let's start right back at the beginning. How in the world did you get into this gig? How, uh, 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 <laughs> I was extruded into it, <laughs> kicking and screaming. No, I mean, extruded. I, that's, extruded. That's, that's a word, word I haven't used in the last day. Uh, forces beyond. Yeah. Me, I okay. Think me there. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I mean, just simply is that uh, after seminary, I started a church in Kansas City and uh, wanted to be faithful and wanted to be fruitful and kind of had a collision of intellectual dissonance on. Um, what the scriptures taught, what the reformers taught, and how I was doing pastoral ministry. I spent the majority of my time in a small sliver of equipping God's people for a very small minority of their life. I call it the majority-minority disparity. Okay. And I had to make some adjustments to try uh-huh. to live an integral life. So we've been on quite a journey of making some change. So this is kind of like – so let, let's do this kind of like those weight ads, you know, the before, before. and the after, all right? Yes. So b- before your pastorate looked like – well, I would say that I was deeply committed to uh, teach the Word of God, to exposit it well. Mm-hmm. I was trained well so by a, a certain good thing. professor um, who will remain nameless. That's right. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, com- committed to teaching the Word and helping people walk closely with Jesus in their own private walk with God and helping them in their family and relationships. That was my primary discipleship paradigm, but uh, that's where I focused before, mm-hmm. um, and I missed some pretty significant aspects of being a faithful and fruitful pastor and equipping people for the majority of their life, which is, for most of us, whether we're paid or not paid, in our workplace. That's right. And, 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 and I like to say that when we, when we divide up life that way and we never speak into the space where people spend most of their time, we actually end up unconsciously um, supporting the secular sacred divide in many ways. We do, and and that sort of platonic dualism and that kind of dualism not only violates scripture, it violates how we're created to live a more seamless, God glorifying life. So to to break that up in pieces is to violate the very nature of how we were made and how we're redeemed in Christ. And yet it's very easy to default in sort of a compartmentalized world. This is my church world, my spiritual world, this is my work world. Yeah, and and, and God's here and God's here, and I'm still yeah. trying to figure out how God's there and how that works. Yes. Yeah. Um and the roots of this uh, change, I take it, went back to um, – I mean, was, was it kind of a – did you just stumble into it, or, or were you doing a series at one point in time, or did someone confront you? How did you, how did you, how did you sense the dissonance? Well, uh, mostly in life I stumble. Uh-huh. The question is whether it's backwards or forwards. <laughs> uh-huh. But some stumbling, some intentionality. I mean, I was taught uh, since I was a boy and certainly uh, at uh, Dallas Seminary when I was here to take seriously the text. Mm-hmm. So my particular interest was in Hebrew and particularly in a word group called the Tamim word group. I mean, there are many Old Testament words in Torah that kind of frame the trajectory of the biblical story. Mm-hmm. So this Tamim idea is that life is meant to be integral, a mm-hmm. seamless idea, mm-hmm. and yet I was finding myself in a very bifurcated and compartmentalized ministry. Hmm. So I began to restudy, particularly Genesis and some of this Hebrew foundation of the life God designed for us that's mm-hmm. redeemed in Christ. Mm-hmm. Began to reread the Reformers. I mean, I'd read them in church history class, uh-huh. but I began to go, whoa. I'm really missing something. So you got reformed on the reformers. <laughs> <laughs> well, I knew the soul is, yeah. <laughs> but I didn't understand the central thread of recovering vocation. As you know, Martin Luther 
classic example, he was, I'd love to meet him, maybe I will someday, uh, I hope, um, but he would say sort of the lowest caste worker is the milkmaid. Think of the person in O'Hare Airport cleaning the bathroom next right, to you, I mean, right, right? right? And the priest doing the sacred uh-huh. uh, sacramental uh-huh. function of the Eucharist uh-huh. uh, as done unto God is the same value in uh-huh. worship. I'm like, whoa. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, I mean, the Reformers really got this, not only the priesthood of believers, but the importance of Monday mm-hmm. and worshiping God and being formed in Christ and living out the gospel on Monday. So. Yeah, I became more and more convinced that I was, uh, I'd embraced an impoverished biblical theology and an impoverished pastoral paradigm, and I needed to make some adjustments to be faithful. So if we're going to talk about discipleship, we've got to talk about discipleship as it, is, as it applies all the time, which includes that 9 to 5 Monday to Friday slot. Yeah, and again, I hadn't thought about the primacy of work as it relates to the Imago Dei mm-hmm. and the image of God. And certainly Jesus as a carpenter and how that fit into the story. So yeah, I just I, – I did – if you'd asked me you know, 25 years ago, if I was discipling people on Monday night, I think I would have said, yeah. Mm-hmm. But it probably would have been more focused on their marriage and relationships and their own walk with God, which is really important, or maybe some evangelism in the workplace. Right. But I didn't have the fullness of what that meant. Yeah, well, we'll come back to this because yeah, okay. this is an important thing. But uh, let's let's you mentioned the importance of Genesis. Uh, quickly uh, explain to us how you see Genesis one and two f- feeding into all this. Yeah, you know, I I think like in, we see the scripture as having one ultimate author, mm-hmm. I trust, uh-huh. uh, and that the, having one author there is coherence, mm-hmm. uh, as I think you say well, narrative or canonical coherence. Right. So. Uh, I spent more time in my sort of interpretive framework of looking at the whole landscape of Scripture, certainly honoring the individual pericopes and the individual sections of Scripture. But that's where I started in Genesis and looked more carefully in Genesis and really began to see things I had not seen before. Um, I know you don't suffer from this, but a great danger, I think it was Abraham Heschel, a rabbi, said that the danger in life is uh, to see what we know rather than know what we see. Mm-hmm. So I slowed down and looked really carefully at what the text said. Mm-hmm. Somebody taught me that well, yeah. a professor that will uh, <laughs> is sitting next to me. Uh, so I mean, when I took some fresh eyes on Genesis, not novel eyes, mm-hmm. fresh eyes, I began to see how central that work was to the image of God and to the biblical story and to fruitfulness. Mm-hmm and the cultural mandate. Mm-hmm. And then I began to see, that's Genesis 1, you know, right. the sense of being fruitful. It was both procreativity and productivity. And then Genesis 2 came into flo- focus, the language of helper, the question mm-hmm. of helper for what? Certainly yeah. there's marriage, but there's work. That's in, right. right. Work is central. And then I saw Genesis 3 for the first time that made so much sense to me that when sin and death enter the world, there's this not only vandalization of shalom, mm-hmm. there's this vandalization of this tamim idea that the Imago Dei is vandalized both in procreativity and productivity because what do you see first, mm-hmm. right? The, the, the curse to the woman is para, the sense of procreativity that she has pain in childbirth, but also there is curse on productivity That's because right. there's thorns and thistles. So I had not seen that before, the cohesiveness and coherence of Genesis 1, 2, and 3. Mm-hmm. And then I think if we see that, then we begin to see how central this idea of working for the glory of God is and how seamless work and worship are designed to be and how the gospel restores that. Yeah, the, the word that I, I, I just come from San Francisco talking to young millennials, mm-hmm. and I told them, I said, a word that has become more and more and more important to me the longer I study Scripture, and it's a word that wasn't in my lexical mm-hmm. register very mm-hmm. much at, uh, with my study, is the word stewardship, right. being good right. stewards, managing the garden well. The call is to, is to manage this creation that God has given us, and that stewarding involves all kinds of levels of service and engagement in which we help one another function in a big society. And part of shalom is when, that, when those cogs turn nicely. Right, <laughs> and, uh, and and sometimes that doesn't happen. So uh, that's exactly right. So we so uh, and, and another thing I like to say is you know we'll talk about marriage, we'll talk about our community, we'll talk about our schools, we'll talk about our politics. You, you go through the list, but what's happening from nine to five? 
a lot of silence. A lot of silence. Yeah. Deafening and, silence. Yeah, and, and to the point where I tease our, our pastoral ministries department now and say, you know, rather than um, saying don't use sports illustrations, maybe you should encourage some illustrations from nine to five. I think so. And, uh, and But keep the sports illustrations. There once in a while. <laughs> yeah, so uh, uh, okay, so, 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 okay, so that was the before, okay? And then, so you realize this. And what did you do next? Well, yeah, I realized it. I, uh-huh. I prayed some by uh-huh. desperation. Okay. I had some conversation with our elders and leadership um, around the text. Mm-hmm. I mean, it has to flow from a theological conviction. And when my leadership team looked at the text with me and said, yeah, so what are the implications, right? What are the practical implications? And that set us on a journey of changing, adjusting a, a local church culture. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not just a program; mm-hmm. it changes the artifacts of language, priorities. Um, and you're so, injecting a fresh yeah, set of values. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and, and making yeah. a point that we want you to live and breathe this. Yes, exactly. Okay. So I'd say that. But the most definitive moment is when I stood before my congregation, mm-hmm. out of my own. I guess a little stupidity, but also hopefully integrity, uh-huh. and ask them for forgiveness. Mm-hmm. I mean, I stood before my congregation and confessed my malpractice. I called it pastoral malpractice. Mm-hmm. It wasn't you know financial embezzlement mm-hmm. or sexual impropriety, mm-hmm. thankfully, but it was very egregious in the sense that they had trusted me to to be faithful to my vocation, mm-hmm. and out of my theological or ignorance, I was not being faithful. So I asked them to forgive me, and I said, from this day, we're going to focus our discipleship on equipping you for the majority of your life. Hmm. Uh, and there was kind of a little bit of pin drop silence, like we kind Where of trust you teach the from? word well. Right? Uh, yeah. But there was enough, in, I think, trust to say that this is what the Scripture teaches, and we want to live more fully into that. And we've all, always said the gospel speaks into every nook and cranny of life. We just weren't living it out right, right. in a local church. Okay. So it was a pretty definitive moment. and. A little bit of pin drop silence. Okay, so now we come to the after. All right. Yep. So, um, so what what is the a- what has the after looked like? Where did you start with this? How did the, how, where did you begin? Yeah, I started with our elders and leaders. Okay, um, and then um, I did a preaching sermon series. Um, it was called Curse of the Cubicle, and we actually in our we now have multi campuses, but in our original campus, it's a set situation. So we actually had a cubicle, a workplace cubicle, as mm-hmm. a prop hmm. when I preached the sermon uh, series. And it was an eight week series on work. And you just sat there and didn't yeah, do yeah. anything? <laughs> I, did. I sat there some. No, I, I think I stood most of the time. But it, but it, but it communicated and yeah, brought right. Monday into Sunday. So just connecting Sunday to Monday, it's right. bringing Monday back into Sunday. And that was, you know, again, we could say that as a preacher, but it was transformational. And mm-hmm. The Spirit of God had worked in people's lives, and people would come up to me and say, I've always felt like a second-class citizen. It's the first time a pastor even cared to talk about this. Hmm. Um, and now I'm seeing it in Scripture. I'm seeing it in terms of Christ being a carpenter. I'm seeing the connections. Mm-hmm. And I, I understand my workplace much differently. So that set our church. I think that sermon series. Uh, and then out of that sermon series, um, we wrote the book Work Matters. People came to us and said, we need to do this. So that began, and we began to think about discipleship and language and uh, Sunday morning benedictions and uh, our liturgy adjustments and things like that, and pastoral prayers began to change. Did you, because uh, I know some churches do this, did you also do some different kinds of commissioning? Um, I, I mean, uh, service is probably too long a word, but commissioning actions to, to affirm people in the various roles that they had in their work? Right. We began to live that priesthood of believers out. And on a Sunday morning, sure, we would commission a short-term cross-cultural missionary because we value that, mm-hmm. or someone going to seminary. Mm-hmm. But we'd also commission people in education and business, uh, blue-collar kind of workers. Um, and we do that periodically still. We call it this time tomorrow. Hmm. Um, and churches around the country are increasingly doing this. It's a brief interview mm-hmm. uh, with a member of the congregation, and we ask three questions. Hmm. The questions are, what do you love about your work? What do you find most meaningful? What do you do? Mm-hmm. What do you find most challenging? How can I pray for you? And mm-hmm. you would not believe hmm. how the congregation, when sometimes they yawn during my sermons, sad to say, yeah. or their phone goes off, mm-hmm. Everybody is locked in on that moment in a worshipful posture like a bird dog. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's amazing how people connect with fellow parishioners who are trying to live their faith out on Monday. It is transformational. Yeah, I just did a little consulting uh, time with uh, the Dallas County Sheriffs. And uh, and my first question to them, as we were talking about team building and that kind of thing, was, 
Um, explain to me what motivates you to do your work other than the fact that you're earning a check. And, uh, and it was amazing mm-hmm. uh, the, the thought people gave to why they were doing what they were doing. And of course, you know, a sheriff is in danger. I mean, they, you know, one of the guys heads up the jail, so, you know, all, sure. the, all the bad guys show up, show up in his neck of the woods. And, uh, and, and, you know, one of the women just came out and said, you know, I, I view it as my service to God. Amen. And wonderful, articulate African American lady just would step forward and said, you know, I'm, this is, this is my ministry. Yeah. And saw it very much in those terms, and and so you get a sense of there are a lot of very dedicated people who are out there who are actually, uh, I think, looking to the church to help them think through that part of their life and that part of their day. Yeah, I agree. Uh, there's just a longing to have their faith connect in their church community life connect with where they spend the majority of their time. That God has called them there to worship Him and to serve others. So another another thing that you did, uh, I understand, is you um, you began to venture out from your own cubicle, right? Yes. Yeah. To uh, to um, you still were studying the word and preparing these messages because you're committed to the text, but uh, you were using other parts of your day differently. How did that work? Yeah, I think that's one of the biggest practical changes because if our vocational paradigm adjusts to make it more theologically robust. Uh, then our on-the-ground praxis changes. So I would say a couple things. One is I begin to pray differently for my congregation, hmm. or more comprehensively. That's mm-hmm. probably a better word to say. Um, I was more aware of their needs and what they were facing across their different vocational spectrums. And part of that came out of, uh, I hope, a greater humility and curiosity and less vocational insularity that, that led me to a praxis that our staff are deeply enmeshed in, just like a hospital visit was workplace visits. Workplace visits became um, not an abnormal routine of a week, but a normal part of a week for our pastors. Mm -hmm. Uh, So that workplace visit was probably the most practical, tangible, scheduled change during the week. And it profoundly changed our staff's preaching, prayer, our relationship with our parishioners, and um, I'd say that was the number one thing that changed. And what do those look like? I mean, uh, do you, is it do you go for lunch and then hang around, or go and then have lunch, or what is what is? Yeah, they take different forms. They do take they take different forms. Um, there has to be the proper protocol of asking permission. Mm-hmm. You don't you know just drop in on someone wherever that workplace is. Right. And there's often security or like in medical HIPAA rules. Right. So you have to be respectful. So you set it up ahead of time. You ask permission for your parishioners. Some Sometimes you can actually go in the workplace someplace, sometimes whether it's a factory or something, you need to have coffee with them at a, in a lunchroom or near there, but go near there. Mm-hmm. But a lot of workplaces you can actually visit if you set it up ahead of time. And um, there's a proper protocol of doing it well is to come with a teachable attitude, a humble attitude, mm-hmm. a curious observation. See, often parishioners think we're the experts. We think we're the experts on everything. We're really not. We have mm-hmm. a small layer of expertise. So it's mm-hmm. beautiful in the priesthood of believers to seek out their expertise and learn. Right. So it's assuming the posture of a humble learner and then getting permission. And I could tell you all kinds of stories about parishioners I visited with in the workplace. But it is profoundly transformational in your discipleship relationship with that pr- pr- uh, parishioner. Because mm-hmm. you, you're seeing how they live and what they're all about, that kind of thing. Yes. And you know how to pray for them. There's a deep bond mm-hmm. for many that you have as a pastor that you would never have if you just focus only on their relational life or their physical health or spiritual life. And um, and this is, I guess this is an interesting question to raise at this point, and that is, I mean, you, you took the initiative to do these, um, but uh, it's... Another way to get there would be for professionals to invite staff to do this. Yeah, I mean, churches around the country, I mean, something's afoot here, uh-huh. uh, and the Spirit of God's working to renew His church, I think. But churches around the country increasingly have things like take your pastor to work day. Mm-hmm. You hear about taking your kid to work day, which is a great idea. <laughs> right? Yeah, right, right, right. As Christians, we should care about our work, right, you know, right. and our parents' work as kids. But uh, things like that where Congregational members can take the initiative to expose their staff 
uh, or their pastors to their world. Mm-hmm. So there are many times when it's reciprocal. Um, one of the interesting things is I've had parishioners, once I visited their workplace, they want to come and see how the Christ Community Sausage is made during the week. <laughs> so I'll there are try times. To. There a are visit times for a draft that choice that to be named uh, later. Cardi- <laughs> a cardiologist come, uh-huh. and I'd spent four hours with his staff, brilliant guy, and uh-huh. I didn't faint uh-huh. uh, when he was doing procedures. Uh-huh. But he said, okay, now it's my turn. So uh-huh. he sat in a whole day of meetings. Uh-huh. You know, Sermon preparation was team. Uh, it sure, was fascinating similar. to yeah, have him yeah, yeah, yeah. evaluate our work. Well, first right. of all, we were doing some work. Right, right, right. right. But, it, but that's another way of, of helping parishioners uh, into your world. Yes, as a pastor. Interesting. Um, so uh, we, you know, we've been in the faith and work thing, both of us, for some time, uh, trying to trying to, you know, crack yeah. the mystery of what's yeah. going on here. Um, and when we come back on the other half, what I want to kind of focus in on is made to flourish and the way it's stepping into this space, and consider the obstacles that come in to mm-hmm. you know what what makes a person slow or a pastor or pastoral staff slow to go here, and you've hinted at it. And why don't we set this up for okay. the second half? And that what are some of the obstacles that you see that get in the way? I know one of the ones that we've identified is is that. A pastoral staff gets so consumed with the programs of the church and what it's doing that mm-hmm. this seems like it's a distraction in some ways. Yeah, you're, we'll, sh- you're shaking we'll, your head. We'll talk about it when you want to talk. About it. Yes, <laughs> yes that's what, I agree. Yeah, yes. and 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 so you know, part of the challenge is to break that mentality to to think through how do you how do you how do you view this activity? The way I like to say it is, is that you know, churches go through a lot of efforts of ingenuity to try and figure out, all right, how can we, how can we gear up for evangelism, and how can we do our outreach? And and my point is, it's already set up, uh, and it doesn't. And you don't have to. It isn't an expensive program. I mean, it's already paid for and everything else. Yes. Is that a good first step yes, in thinking it's a about good this? First step. Yeah. But let's talk about the obstacles because there are great opportunities. And there's sizable obstacles for us to really be more fully invested here. And your challenge, uh, we got a little bit of time still. Uh, your challenge here is uh, with Made to Flourish is to try and encourage pastors in this direction. Is that right? Is yes. that this designed to do? Yeah, we we are deeply committed on two fronts in Made to Flourish is to help pastors be more spiritually whole. Mm-hmm. And that's an ongoing journey of our own formation, our right. own sanctification. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then also. As a part of that is being more effective in our pastoral mission mm-hmm. in equipping people for Monday. So both we call it a sense of encouraging wholeness, mm-hmm. uh, but also a pastoral effectiveness for mm-hmm. both faithfulness and fruitfulness. Hmm. But because to be faithful, we are to be fruitful biblically. Mm-hmm. So how do we enhance the fruitfulness in our pastoral work? I think is really really important. And so, and part of doing that fruitful exercise is um, invigorating. Uh, the life of the parishioner in those locations where God has them, basically, is is part of what, what we're talking about. Yeah. It's shifting mm-hmm. from almost exclusively, I'll say that confessionally, uh-huh. for pastors, especially the larger organization you, uh, you serve, mm-hmm. from running Sunday and mm-hmm. making sure Sunday is good, which is important, right. to shifting our primary focus to Monday. Right. And the rest of the week. And the rest of the week. That well, is the big shift. Not okay. to diminish the gathered church's stewardship. Mm-hmm. Pastor has a stewardship. Sunday matters. Okay. It's just often for us it matters at the expense of Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Did did it, has the Kern Family Foundation helped to underwrite Made to Flourish? Yeah, I mean the history of Made to Flourish is that Christ Community Church and the Kern Family Foundation came together now about eighteen months ago mm-hmm. uh, in an institutional partnership to launch Made to Flourish, and the Kern family are deeply invested in renewing the church and culture. Mm-hmm. So they are deeply invested in Made to Flourish. That's great. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, so let's talk about how this worked. So, you, so you, so. What are the obstacles? What are some of the obstacles that you see? You, we've, you've kind of given the big overview on the church gets consumed with making sure Sunday works, if I can yeah. say it that way, yeah. and then they forget about the work the rest of the week. Um, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. so, I mean, that says it harshly, but, but in one sense, it's, it's probably, again, pretty true that in terms of the way things get addressed. So, so what are some of the obstacles that you see? Yeah, there are sizable ones, Daryl. I think, first of all, when I – 
made my transition and found myself extruded in this national conversation about, let's just say, the Sunday to Monday gap, this dualism. Extruded again, man. Exactly. I was was extruded into it. I didn't didn't go running to it. I'm going to go home and use my word for that. My word for the day is extruded. And my wife's going to look at me and say, did you just insult me? (laughs) (laughs) Well, it just seems the right word. It wasn't me just charging it. I felt like I was kind of... You know, yeah. Into it. So I thought, first of all, that the greatest challenge would of the Sunday to Monday gap, using that language, would be in the, you know, the pews or mm-hmm. the chairs. And then over time, I began to realize as I was across tribes, the greatest challenge, an obstacle, is the pulpit. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I do. I, I'm one of those guys who have failed greatly, and so I'm humbly appealing to my pastors, my brothers and sisters, uh, that I think the greatest obstacle is us. Mm-hmm. And on a couple of fronts. First of all, at least for me, mm-hmm. and I don't want to project on is that we need to stay very teachable on the text. None of us have it all figured out, mm-hmm. right? And we need to be in the text and let the text speak to us and be open and teachable to hear what the text says and maybe adjust some of our thinking. Some of us think that we've got it all figured out because mm-hmm. we've been trained. Mm-hmm. And um, So I'm just saying for me, it was to uh, it keep staying curious and humble and listen to the text and then to wrestle with what the implications were. So when I have a con- – the greatest obstacle to me mm-hmm. okay, as a pastor is a theological obstacle hmm. that we don't see, many of us, what the text says mm-hmm. from creation to consummation mm-hmm. and wrestle with the implications for our own vocational faithfulness. So I'm just saying I always start with teaching a robust theology. And I think that's the biggest obstacle is our – lack of engagement with the text, we tend to see what we know Mm -hmm. rather than know what we see there. At least that was for me. Now, I want to elaborate on this because I think this is something that that has bothered me a long time, and that goes something like this. We think we teach theology when we get the ideas of the text right. But we actually don't teach theology until we get the values and the relationships in the text right. Is that a fair distinction? I think that's a good distinction. Um, and so uh, my, my point would be, if you get that distinction, that we actually end up teaching and preaching half of what the Bible is about. And the sad part is, although it's the framing half of what the Bible teaches, which is crucial. Yeah. <clears throat> It's not the delivery part of what the Bible teaches, which is also yeah. quite crucial. Yeah. I, I'm with you, at least in my experience, and I don't want to project it on others, yeah. but I had a, a strong value of systematic theology that brings what I call sort of a logical consistency mm-hmm. within our limitations as, as humans in our interpreting the text. But I didn't have that, that canonical coherence that helped shape that hermeneutical process and then I didn't have the kind of marination in the spirit and rest and reading others to say, what are the implications of this on these levels of value and relationships right. and praxis? So I would say not to spend too much time here, but I think I, as a pastor, the last thing I'm looking for, I feel like a goalie in a hockey net. The more it ex- complex your organization is, there are so many pucks coming at you. Right, right. And most of the pucks are driven by marketing, and I'm not diminishing all right, that, right. and church growth strategies. Right. So many of us... Well, you're going for yeah, connection. You're yeah. trying to connect to people. And many of us, like, what's the next thing? Right, I'm right. sick of it. Right, right, right. Right. And that's an obstacle if we see this faith, work, and economic conversation through sort of a a church growth strategy or an addendum, uh-huh. where we have to go is to see how central – it's not the only thing right. – but how central this theological thread is uh, throughout all of Scripture. And if we have that conviction, then it begins to not be something we're adding on, faith, mm-hmm. work, and economic integration. It is something that is woven through our ministry and what we're already doing and begins to change. Does that make sense? I mean, yeah. Let me, let me try another yeah. metaphor, because I, th- I think this is important. Um, the, the local church is like a hub, but the business of the hub is not about the hub. The business is about hub is to be a hub, and the hub ha- is supposed to um, 
work outwards, if you will, and work into right. other places. You come here, and so when you're just focused on the hub, you're suffering from nearsightedness. You're, you're, you're so focused on what's going on in here that you forget this is supposed to be a generative place yes. that is uh, sending things out. And now the metaphor I have of making cotton candy, <laughs> you know. It's you terrible know, for you. Yeah, okay, that's right. all that sugar. No, come on, well, well. I'm just sorry, Daryl. Just enjoy like, it. You're okay. under, I I'm think trying you're to under, track with you're you. Under, 10. You're under okay, 10, okay, okay? All right. And that machine is throwing all yeah, the, all this yeah. stuff out, you know, and, and and it gathers and it and finally you've got this yeah. wonderful piece of cotton candy that you're mm-hmm. staying and you go, ooh, that was cool. Yeah. I mean, I remember I used to stand at the cotton candy machine even after I was all messy, and so that is really an interesting machine. How in the world does that work? <laughs> and, and, and so um, I, that's the way I think of the church in some ways. It's this generator, it's this hub, and it's supposed to be sending out. Out, um, light and aroma, to use biblical metaphors, right. um, into the world. And if we don't do that, then somehow we've we've missed it. Yeah, I, I think that's exactly right. And we have a role. Of, let's use I like the word gathered, scattered church. Mm-hmm. And in a pastoral role, we are to care for both. But mm-hmm. our primary focus again for most of us is the gathered church. We rate ourselves by bodies, buildings, mm-hmm. bucks. Not that metrics don't matter, but most of our focus, our peer evaluation, our reviews are about the metric health of the church, usually in terms of number of bodies on Sunday morning, the size of our buildings and budget. Those don't those do matter institutionally, so mm-hmm. I'm not diminishing that. But we're not evaluated and prayerful and passionate about Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday at other people's place of work. We we're very excited about our place of work, mm-hmm. but we're not focused there. Yeah, and that's the power of transformation. You know, I've had conversations with pastors where they will say things like, um, uh, "Well, we're we're about it, and we're deeply committed to edification. We want our people to be edified, and they, and they do it in this in the way I was talking about earlier, which is this." Uh, you know, we're delivering ideas. We're getting them to think about the scripture, right. that kind right. of thing. But the but that other layer is is sort of is sort of and often missing. And particularly, what's interesting is in the, when the focus becomes so focused on edification, you lose your focus on outreach. And I and I want to connect these two while while I've got you here. And it, and I'm going to try and set it up this way. I tell people that the way they do their work matters, one, because their work does matter. Itself. Okay, yeah, itself. That's important. But also, the way in which they do their work builds their credibility with the people they work with, which sets up everything else that, in some, to some degree, they really care about, which is to eventually to have those conversations with the people they work with and the people they care about that, that focus on spiritual things. And actually, there are texts that say this. You know, if you're poor in managing the earthly things, who's going to give you the spiritual things to take care of? Exactly. And what I would say is that when I appeal to my fellow 501c3 leaders (laughs) in that world, if we do not intentionally, passionately, prayerfully connect Sunday to Monday, then there are five crucial things at stake. Let me highlight those very briefly. First, the worship of God is at stake Mm -hmm. because worship was meant to be a 24-7 nanosecond relationship with God in everything we are and everything we do everywhere, Mm -hmm. not just Sunday. Right. Secondly, the spiritual formation of God's people are at stake Mm -hmm. because a good amount of our formation happens not just on Sunday preaching, it happens on Monday suffering and difficulty in the workplace and opportunity. So I'm saying being filled with the Spirit is working in the Spirit. So I'm saying spiritual formation is on the line. The third thing which you're alluding to, I think, really brilliantly, Mm -hmm. is the plausibility of the gospel. Mm -hmm. The gospel needs to often be seen Mm -hmm. as it is heard or before it's heard. Right. And that's what you're getting at, I think, is like in my workplace where the world comes together today, where many will never step in the church, the Christian witness the, the plausibility of the gospel is lived out in the workplace more than any other place in our You culture. become the only Bible some people will ever read. It's exactly right. Yeah. It doesn't mean that we don't proclaim the words, right. but plausibility leads to proclamation. So what's at stake is not only the plausibility of the gospel, but the proclamation of the gospel. Because mm-hmm. that's the place where ma- the vast majority of our people who we serve are going to have the opportunity to boldly, credibly, passionately share their faith to someone who's never heard it. And then the last thing is at stake is the common good. Mm -hmm. So the rightful worship of God, the spiritual formation of God's people, the plausibility of the gospel itself, Mm -hmm. the proclamation of the gospel and the common good, all five of those, and there are more, are at stake 
if we focus on the minority of people's lives rather than equipping them for the majority. Yeah, I, 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 I think this is just so profoundly important because I, I do think that that actually, if you, and if you think about it, the second half of this, of course, is is that when you view it this way, when you see people who are out there as part of the extended mission of the church, yes. okay, you you know who needs an evangelistic program? It's already designed. It's already there. I mean, God has already done it. Yeah. Why? Why do you need to add something on top of it? It's, and so you want to equip people for the places and spaces where God has people. Exactly, and that way, the local church. We do have programs. We have intentional pathways for spiritual growth, but it's not program driven. It's mission driven and cultural reinforced. A culture that you create. Um, I think one of the most important parts of leadership it comes way back to the garden of cultivating and keeping the garden. Same mm-hmm. two Hebrew infinitives, right? Mm-hmm. To cultivate and keep. Right. That's part of a steward, mm-hmm. right? Right. And that we steward an organization and a local church, and we nourish that culture of cultivation and protection. And in that, we find the trajectory of this powerful mission that God has already put in place in every nook and cranny. Already there. So at Christ Community, for example, or one example, we have some programs, but we don't have a faith, work, and economic program. Right. We don't have a faith, work, and economic center. Now, some churches do, and that's fine. Yeah. But I'm saying it is woven into from cradle to grave. You're not going to miss it, is the point. Our preaching, our prayers. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And then we're unleashing the church. Okay, let me let me deal with two other issues yeah. that I think are important, and you may have others. Uh, the first is this. You already talked, alluded to this a little bit, and that is people are only – in the church getting equipped for a short period of time. Very short. (laughs) Okay. In comparison to all the other cultural influences that are pounding on them on a regular basis. So if you actually don't equip them to think through how they spend that time and that space and how they engage, by default, they will – the culture will overwhelm them. Yeah. And one of my great blessings in life. One of my greatest privileges is to spend a lot of time at Dallas Willard, the late Dallas Willard. And Dallas Willard would say over and over again that we are being spiritually formed all the time. The question are, and I'll use more mm-hmm. Aristotelian language, mm-hmm. the question is, are we being more formed into vice mm-hmm. or to virtue? Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. So we are being formed. Right. The question is, which direction are we heading? Right. And if we do not equip our congregants to be spiritually formed in what they do every day, then they are going to. It's not a neutral zone that I can That's see. It's exactly like the deeds right. of the flesh That's and the right. spirit, right? That's right. It, it's, we're going one or the other direction. So I mean, I'm just saying we equip them to move to greater Christ-likeness, and I love the virtue language of Second Peter in mm-hmm. our text, but we are equipping them. We have to do that. And, the, and, and, when, and you use the word virtue when I'm talking about values and relationships. Yep. That's, that's, what, that's what that is. Those virtues apply to the way I engage with people in such a way. I like to yeah. say, if you take a really close look at the fruit of the Spirit, it's actually pretty relational stuff. It is. And, uh, and it's designed to bring the shalom, the peace that God wants in our relationships, our relationship that we have with Him is designed to change us in the way we're relating to others. That's why you get the great commandment, all those kind of – that's all an ethical base. You know, we talk about the creation, uh, fall, redemption, consummation story, but there's another story that's running through Scripture that's pretty important, and that is the way in which our love and security that we get from our relationship with God drives our love and security in the way we relate to others. Yeah, and you know, you know as well from Augustine to Aquinas, but this disordered love is at the heart of vice, mm-hmm. right? And ordering our loves, right? To love rightly mm-hmm. is so deeply embedded in that story, and obviously, it has to be in Christ and the power of the Spirit. But yeah, the to cur- love rightly. The cur- the curveball that I always think of is the passage you know, that leads into the parable of the Good Samaritan, where the scribe and, and, um, and the l- religious lawyer, if you will, asks Jesus, you know, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus. Jesus, which he often he asks a question back. Well, how do you see it? And at least in the Luke conversion, this is the way it goes. And in the and the scribe says, "Well, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbors yourself." And I find myself looking at that answer and going, "You know, if I ask that question on an exam in a soteriology class, I don't think that's the answer I would get from students, and I don't think that's the answer I would give if I were asked the question." And yet. Jesus turns around and he says, you've, you've answered you rightly, you know, do this and you will live. And, and it, 
for years, I couldn't figure out what was going on there. And all of a sudden, it dawned on me, you know what Jesus is telling the scribe? This is the way life is designed to be lived. And if life is supposed to be lived that way, then this is a pretty important thing. It's called a great commandment for a reason. And and then and so, you know, we worry about how we fall short and don't get there. But if you want to know what the target is, that's the target in terms of values and relationships. And so um, mm-hmm. it transformed the way I read scripture. Uh, because all of a sudden, I'm not just in a world of ideas. I'm in a world of relating. I'm in a world of connecting with people. I'm in a world of trying to understand and and become more sensitive, turning that arrow that tends to go yeah. inward and move it outward, yeah. that kind of thing. And that's actually what I think the church has to do. It has an arrow that's pointed inward towards what happens on Sunday, and it needs to have an arrow that's pointed outward towards what's happening uh, all around them that they're actually equipping people for the bulk of the time. Yeah. Well, the threat of relationships – uh, are so central to Scripture. Even what it means to know Hebrew is to know someone first. Yeah, mm-hmm. to know someone, mm-hmm. not just something. Right. So I'm just saying the thread of relationships. Even and John Kilner said this well. But the image of God, this Salem, is both connection and reflection. Mm-hmm. So that deep sense of relation. I'm just saying that relational thread is so central to the good, true, and beautiful life of great sort of Aristotelian virtue ethics. And Jesus. Talks about that in the Sermon on the Mount. So, uh, and even Peter in Second Peter, in this great text of we are partakers of the divine nature. I mean, the sense of this gospel text goes from where in his virtue and language he goes from faith to love. Mm-hmm. He builds to love. That's right. So I just want I just absolutely that sense of increasingly loving what Jesus loves uh, is such a part of this uh, journey of greater Christ-likeness, and and it matches, again, the great virtues of the good, true, and beautiful life. Now, here's the second one, and this may seem like a curveball, but it's it's intentional. That's right. And and it's this, that in thinking about these relationships, we're not Mm -hmm. just thinking about the relationships that are easy. We're not just thinking about the relationships where we're thinking about people who are like us. We're actually being pushed to think about stepping into relationships where people are different from us. So we're talking about relating uh, to some degree also cross-culturally in our jobs. And one of the beautiful things about the workplace today is is that it is a demographic mix. And we we have the potential – this is important – we have the potential to step into those kinds of spaces and to walk into that kind of a world. But our instinct is not to go there. Mm-hmm. So that one of the challenges, it seems to me, that the church has is to challenge people in the context of the workplace, in the context of the job they do, in getting to know the people they work with, to really think through getting to know the people who they work with who are different than they are. Yeah, it's a marvelous way God designed the world, isn't it? Mm-hmm. From the nations to the Great Commission, that God is caring about all nations, all ethnic groups, all that great diversity. And we live in a time of great pluralism mm-hmm. and diversity. There's many good opportunities there. And so I just want to say, yeah, this is an opportunity for us to enter a space where we uh, have uh, the need for humility and good listening and love and understanding and uh, find that common ground of the Imago Dei, the image of God, right? The common grace. And it is in that common grace, that fertile soil where saving grace often finds root. Mm-hmm. So we don't just love people because they're going to come to Jesus, right? That's right. But we love them because they're on a they project. Are, they are, they they're are people. Made in God's image. Yeah. They're precious in God's sight. But it's interesting when I watch how common grace and saving grace work together in Scripture mm-hmm. that there is a corollary mm-hmm. of loving and serving the just and the unjust. But in that, the gospel message finds great traction. And also mirroring something that I think is fundamental, and that is never forgetting where you came from, that God approached right. you not because you were entitled to be approached, right. but specifically because you weren't entitled to be approached, and yet he, by his goodness and grace, yeah. reached out to you. So we're to share this, this capability, this ability to reach out to others. Yeah, and I think it's a posture of gratitude, mm-hmm. right? We tend to get into comparison mm-hmm. versus celebrating their life and the value they bring. Um, so yeah, I, I find that very much it's, an, it's, it's a posture. It's also taking the initiative of love. Mm-hmm. Love seeks to build up. It takes the initiative. And it's really, again, back to your relational love categories. Interesting. So um, OK, so that's kind of some of my list of the obstacles that I see and, and in some cases the challenges that are in front of us. Anything else that we've left out that, that – 
uh, that constitutes an, another obstacle that we need to think about? I think just like many of our parishioners, uh, obstacle again is finding ourselves filled with lots of activity mm-hmm. and confusing activity as fruitfulness or accomplishment. Productivity, yeah. So I think most of us have to have good places of assessment, good critique from others to say, am I being busy, am I having lots of activity, or am I being faithful in my vocation Hmm. and not frenetic? Mm -hmm. So I would say that's one of the big obstacles. I'm just saying from a pastor's standpoint is that we can do so many things and get, quote, so busy and Mm -hmm. be so active that our own relationship with God and others suffers. And then the mission is not advanced mm-hmm. because we're not active in the right places. We're mm-hmm. busy but not productive. I think that's a big obstacle. And the potential for, for just the amount of information flow that we have access to, which could be overwhelming, there's no way to keep up with it all. You've got to prioritize it, um, uh, can, can be so overwhelming that you can get lost in that sea of activity slash information that you're trying to gather and in the process disconnect from people yep. While you're <laughs> collecting <laughs> collecting your facts, if you will, yeah, and I, I, so, I, so I say I think it's personal management, personal impact that other people are speaking into your life. This is again why we have a network. It helps us sharpen one another in faithful uh, discipleship. That's what we're trying to do with Made the Flourish. We're trying to create a network of people who are not just busy, but are helping each other to greater wholeness and greater joy, but greater missional effectiveness. All of us want to be effective. Now, we're real tight for time, yep. but um, so do you connect pastors to one another? How does Made to Flourish work? Yeah, Made to Flourish is a network where uh, we have a website that allows people to come and get all kinds of resources. So wherever you are uh, in the world, mm-hmm. you can go and figure out some of the best resources to help you be more effective in connecting Sunday to Monday. We also have learning communities in different cities, and we're having an increased network uh, in right now 20 cities. We're mm-hmm. only 18 months old. Mm-hmm. So pastors can not only connect with our website, but in many cities already, there's a network building. Hmm. And you can go on our website and find where those networks are and get involved. We have luncheons, different things like where people are helping each other grow. Okay. Well, that's exciting. Well, yeah. made uh, to flourish.org. Made to flourish. Great, there you go. The uh, that was my next question. Yeah, Very good. Up. Well, thanks, Tom, for coming in and Thank talking you. with us about this. This is, a, I mean, we, uh, we've talked about this a lot just personally and, and something that uh, that we both care very, very deeply about. We think that it makes for effective uh, ministries, effective pastors, effective churches, and it uh, it actually helps to accomplish one of the things that Jesus did ask disciples to do, which we call affectionately the Great Commission. So, uh, so we go for it. So I thank you for coming in and being thank a part you, of our time, and we thank you for being a part of the table. And we hope you'll join us again soon. Thanks for listening to The Table Podcast. For more podcasts like this one, visit dts.edu slash the table. Dallas Theological Seminary. Teach truth. Love well.